It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, speaker, before I begin, I think it's important just to thank the um, uh, Environmental Commissioner Diane Sachs, Erwin Elman, the Child Advocate, and Francois Boileau, the French Language Commissioner, for all of the work that they've done over many years as advocates for uh, the people of the province. Can we get up and applaud? <laughs> Uh, speaker, my first question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the mayors of 28 of Ontario's largest cities issued a statement denouncing what they call a stealth campaign of cuts affecting everything from public health to policing to flood management to childcare. The Ford government has spent the last month denying that these cuts are even happening. Is the Premier saying that these 28 mayors are wrong and he's right? The question for the Premier. Solicitor General. Referred to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, uh, while the member opposite and the leader of the NDP can choose to keep repeating um, things that, frankly, uh, we do not subscribe to in our party and uh, in our government, we are going to continue to actively work and engage our municipal partners. As you know, me, we, we meet with uh, ministers of the Crown, meet with AMO uh, at least once a month, often more than that, to talk about the changes that we are making, to initiate conversations that ensure that what people want to protect and what matters most to Ontario residents is looked after by all levels of government. Whether that happens at the federal, provincial or municipal, we all have a responsibility to ensure that the dollars that are spent collected when we uh, collect Response. taxpayers' dollars end up being the most efficient here, here. and ensuring the safety, health and safety of our residents. That's what we do when we work with our municipal partners, and that's what we will continue to do. Thank you. Supplementary. It seems to me the government has a, a pretty twisted idea of what partnership means, Speaker. <laughs> the Premier can have his ministers deny his uh, reckless cuts, but no one believes them anymore, especially when 28 mayors representing 67 per cent of the province's population say that these cuts will have a devastating impact. Wow. They've asked the Premier, at the very least, to delay the cuts so that they can actually plan instead of reeling as the Ford government lurches from one stealth cut to the next. Is the Premier willing to consider that request? The question from the to the Solicitor General. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Speaker. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. Uh, through you to the uh, Leader of the Opposition. I, I, I spoke to Mayor Cam Guthrie from uh, Guelph uh, this morning. He's the uh, chair of the uh, Large Urban Mayors Committee, or LUMCO. Uh, we had a very good chat, and uh, I'm sure it's, uh, it's a con conversation we are going to continue. As uh, the Solicitor General outlined in the first part of the question, we have a framework of consultation uh, with the, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. LUMCO has a seat at that table, and it's a confidential process. So while I, I'm not going to betray the confidentiality of uh, some of our discussions, some of the discussions we've had with, uh, with ministers and uh, AMO and their affiliates, we've had a, a very good con uh, conversation. The, the member is right, the Solicitor General is Response. right. Uh, we, we do meet on a monthly basis. There are other meetings that take place uh, uh, if there is an emerging and important item. And suffice it to say, uh, I had a very good conversation with Mayor Guthrie. Look forward to continuing to engage long. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, I'm sure what the minister called the chat, the other person in the conversation is calling something completely different. Right. Uh, but nonetheless, the Premier's cuts are hitting municipalities, and these are services that families across our province rely on, Speaker. Only the Ford government could cut flood management in the midst of unprecedented flooding. Yep. Cut immunization programs, just as health experts are warning of a measles outbreak, or cut public health while they claim to be tackling hallway medicine, and then have the brass, the brass to claim that they weren't doing it. 28 mayors have joined Side the chorus, order. the loud chorus of doctors, nurses, scientists, and tens of thousands of average citizens who say these cuts are dangerous and absolutely indefensible. Why is the Premier so certain that all of these people are wrong and he alone is right? Questions have referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Health. 
Thanks. Thanks again, Speaker. We're going to continue to have uh, conversations with Ontario's large urban mayors. We're going to continue to engage the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Unlike the previous government that expanded that consultation to every couple of months, we meet with them every month. We, we give them a door to be open uh, in the interim if there is an issue that they want to speak about. And I find it, quite frankly, pretty rich from the Leader of the Opposition, who has supported the Liberal government. They were spending $40 million a day more than they were taking in. We were saddled with a tremendous deficit that, I have to say, our, our, our budget that Minister Fideli has tabled, what's protecting uh, the things that matter most to Ontarians, is a responsible plan. We're going to continue to engage our municipal partners. We're going to listen to them. We're going to work with them. And, and it's quite funny that the Leader of the Opposition seems to think she knows the conversation between Mayor Guthrie and I this morning. I find that very, very strange. The next question. Next question. Again, the Leader of the Official Opposition. This question is also for the Premier, but what i got to say is pretty rich, is that this government and these ministers don't remember when they were in opposition uh, trying to support municipalities to overcome the downloading of the last time they are as government. The Conservative government was in, in, a, in office under, under Mr. Harris. It's, it's quite rich, Speaker. Uh, anyways, the question is to the Premier. Order. Yesterday, the government Premier wrote order. to the Mayor of Toronto, insisting that the— I stopped the clock. Member for King Vaughan will come to order. Member for Sault Ste. Marie will come to order. Restart the clock. Leader of the Opposition, I apologize. Yesterday, the Premier wrote to the Mayor of Toronto insisting that the Ford government budget cuts to public health won't impact the programs public health provides. The Chief Medical Officer of Health, the Ontario Medical Association, doctors, nurses, school boards, and of course the Mayor himself disagree. Speaker. Does anyone who doesn't work for the Premier support his view? Question for the Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, and we actually made our response uh, public to the Mayor of Toronto. I find it ironic. I spent four years down there, and the present Mayor hasn't found a single penny of efficiencies in over a $13 billion budget. They have a fleet of cars down there, $10 million, and they're still getting paid for their cars. They're getting millions of dollars to to actually go out and water dead trees. To tell me there is an efficiency to be found, and by the way, it's 0.024 of a percent. They can't find that, Mr. Speaker, in a budget. We have serious problems at the City of Toronto. All they know how to do at the City of Toronto is tax people, spend their money, not, not drive efficiencies. They don't care about the taxpayers' money at the City of Toronto. We do care about the Response. taxpayers' money. We're still splitting the expense 50-50. That's pretty good, if you ask me, here, here. Mr. Speaker. Take Restart the clock. Supplementary. Well, I think what's pretty ironic, Speaker, is the Premier obviously wants to be there over in the City of Toronto, but for some reason he's here. That's what's pretty ironic, Speaker. Order. The Premier simply cannot have it both ways. When you cut Order. funding to public health. Stop the clock. The member for Markham Stouffville will come to order. The member for Mississauga East Cooksville can come to order. I can hear what you're saying. You don't have to yell across the floor. If we took a poll of our visitors, I'm not sure how many would be impressed by the behaviour from some members. Let's think about that. Start the clock. Again, I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. The Premier can't have it both ways, Speaker. When you cut funding to vital public health services, you can't pretend that those services won't suffer. And they're vital services that keep us healthy and out of hospitals, whether it's immunization or school breakfast programs. That's the fact. It keeps us healthy and out of our hospitals. Is the Premier seriously arguing that he can hit public health with retroactive budget cuts, but that public health won't suffer? Premier. 
through, through you, Mr. Speaker. What the Leader of the Opposition doesn't say is over the past 10 years, Toronto Public Health has run a cumulative surplus of $52 million. That's $52 million with a surplus nearly $12 million in 2011. Where's the money? Where's that money, Mr. Speaker? Let's talk about the $20 billion our government has taken and given to the, the uh, City of Toronto by uploading the backlog repairs for the TTC. Where's that $20 billion? I don't hear the Mayor talking about the $27 billion investment we're putting into transit. It's all right to talk about, again, 0.024%, less than one-third of a percent Response. that they can't find efficiencies. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, they need to wake up, smell the coffee, and start driving efficiencies for the taxpayers of this city. Like we are. Stop the call. Members, take your seats. Order. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the last time the Conservatives drived efficiencies, we ended up with Walkerton, and that's certainly not something that we want to have again in the province of Ontario. Sure. That's something the Premier needs to think about. He needs to think about outward. Stop the clock. Okay. Order. 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 If this continues, I will start warning members. If I have to warn them the next time, they will be named. We're going to have order here. The Minister of Infrastructure will come to order. Restart the clock. Again, I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. In neighbor neighbourhoods and communities across Ontario, public health units are providing vital services that keep us all healthy. I've said it once, and I'm going to keep saying it because it's the truth. Programs like breakfast programs, school immunization, dental clinics, where in my own community, over 50 per cent of kids in, in grade two had cavities in their mouth that were untreated. Long-term care centres. Doctors, nurses, mayors from across Ontario of every political stripe speaker have told the Premier that these, could, these cuts put all of these services in all of these communities at risk. At what point will the Premier realize that all of the bluster and denials won't change the fact that his reckless uh, cuts will do serious, serious damage and that it's actually time to reverse direction and stop the cuts from happening? Question is to the Premier. Solicitor General. To the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the NDP can continue to chase headlines and continue to repeat rhetoric that, frankly, has no valid validity while we protect what matters most. I want to talk about some of the investments that our Deputy Premier and Minister of Health have already made as a government. A commitment of an additional 15,000 long term care beds, half of which we have already announced and we're not even a year in. seniors for free dental care, here, here. 384 million additional funding in hospital operational funding, 27 million over 10 years for hospital infrastructure. You know, Speaker, I could go on and on, but I'm focusing and our government is focusing on what matters most, and we will stop the, the inappropriate Response. spending like, for example, watering dead tree stumps. Here, here. The next question. The next question. The leader of the opposition. Premier, earlier today, the. Uh oh. Earlier today, the Ford government announced their intention to start. Stop the clock. The member for Sault Ste. Marie is warned. I don't know if there's a confidence vote later on today, or not. I apologize again to the Leader of the Opposition. Start the clock. Thank you, Speaker. Earlier today, the Ford government announced their intention to start a hostile takeover of Toronto's transit system. The province is supposedly still at the negotiating table with the city. I apologize. Again, stop the clock. Member for King Vaughan is warned. Restart the clock. 
Leader of the Opposition. The province is supposedly still at the negotiating table with the City of Toronto on this matter. The Premier hasn't even come close to answering serious co questions about this scheme, and Toronto Council has been clear it's a scheme that will not work for the people of Toronto. Does the Premier have any intention of actually working with the City in good faith, or is this yet another example of a Premier stubbornly imposing his will and refusing to acknowledge the serious consequences? Questions to the Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, boy, talk about rich, talk about ironic. We've had a stagnant transit system here for the last three decades. You look at the map of the TTC, it's not moving. Through the great work of our Minister of Transportation, <laughs> he's been he's put out an incredible, incredible plan, no matter if it's the Ontario line starting at Ontario Place, going up to the Ontario Science Centre, if it's extending the Eglinton Line out west all the way out to the airport to serve the people in Etobicoke, yeah. or it's to the great people of Scarborough that have been waiting, waiting for transit waiting. for decades and decades. Waiting. We're going to make sure we have a three-stop subway stop right there. And another great announcement to the people up in Richmond Hill. We're going to run the Young Line all the way up to Richmond yeah, Hill. Yeah. We're putting the larger, largest investment in Ontario's history, in the country's history, in North America, a $27 billion investment. Here. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I guess the Premier doesn't remember the last time the Conservatives were in office when they buried the Eglinton subway tunnel that was being built to expand subways in the province. But it's clear that the Premier is ploughing ahead with a hostile takeover of the TTC without the permission of the people who built, paid for, and used the subway. Just like he's ignoring the doctors who provide public health or teachers in a classroom after decades and decades of transit delay, some Order. of which was caused by the Premier during his time at City Hall. The the people of Toronto want their leaders to work together to get transit built. Instead, the Premier is changing plans and attempting to impose his will yet again. Why won't the Premier realize that this actually will lead to further delays, less transit and more gridlock? Stop the clock again. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry is warned. The member for Niagara West is warned. You. Start the clock. Premier, to reply. The great Minister of Transportation. <laughs> the Minister of Transportation. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate the, uh, member, the leader of the opposition, the NDP, are mischaracterizing this uh, entire announcement that uh, we will be introducing legislation tomorrow. We are stepping forward with ensuring that— uh, I'm going to ask the Minister to withdraw. I withdraw. Blue is answered. So, Mr. Speaker, what we are doing is we have been working with the City of Toronto since last November. We campaign on a promise to upload the subway. We campaign on a promise to build new subways for the City of Toronto. The old system was not working, Mr. Speaker. They are unable to expand this current subway network, and we are going to do that, Mr. Speaker. We've been working with Mayor Tory and his staff since November, working towards the terms of reference. We've been meeting with them weekly as we progress towards the upload, which is going to benefit not only the people of Toronto, but the entire but. province as a whole. Mr. Speaker, i got to ask the, the Leader of the Opposition a serious question. She gets upset when she claims we're downloading services. We're actually uploading $20 billion worth of network into our province. Is she for uploading or not, Mr. Speaker? She needs to get on the record. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Next question. Start the clock. Member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This week, the Premier travelled to New York City with the Minister of Finance. They were in the Big Apple to speak to investors to Wall Street, promote our 2019 budget, and let our largest trading partner know Ontario is open for business and open for jobs. Since being elected, we have been cutting red tape through measures and making Ontario Open for Business Act and restoring Ontario's Competitiveness Act. 
We are providing corporate income tax relief through the Job Creation Investment Incentive, and we are fixing the Liberals' hydro mess. Could the Premier explain to the House how important it is to bring our open for business message to international investors? Question to the Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Well, myself and my all star Minister of Finance went to New York, and I'll tell you, that was one of the most rewarding trips, not only for us, but the people of Ontario, when we talked to the largest investment firms in the entire world the entire world that stopped investing in Ontario, stopped investing in Canada because of the tragedy they see, they saw what took place over the last 15, 15 years. When we told them that we were cutting the red tape by 25 percent, saving businesses over $400 million, cutting regulations, making sure we reduce hydro rates, <coughs> making sure that we put a job creation investment incentive of $4 billion. They were excited. We talked to numerous Fortune 500 companies, and they look forward Response. to coming, creating jobs, creating investment in Ontario. Here, here. The, the member for Hamilton East, Tony Creek, has to come to order. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Premier for his response. Business finally have a government and a Premier who understand business. They have confidence in the government again. Ontario has created 123,000 jobs since we took office nine months ago. It is because we are creating an environment where job creators can thrive, and because after 15 years of liberal waste, scandal and mismanagement, we are getting our fiscal house in order again. Our 2019 budget protects what matters most to Ontario families while providing a clear path to balance. Could the Premier outline for the House how our budget was received by investors and businesses in New York? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank our all-star member of Parliament, Provincial Parliament from Richmond Hill, doing a great job. Dave. And I apologize, I didn't say that at the beginning. I got so excited about this trip to New York, I took off on that, so my apologies. When we went to New York, and again, we, we met with private companies, Fortune 500 companies, we met with investors a few times, and there was one investment company, the largest in the world, told us they had never seen a prosperous country in a prosperous province, Ontario, dismantle the energy file ever in their entire lives. They said the investments just dried up. No one was interested in investing in Ontario or Canada anymore. The exact words is they systematically destroyed your energy file. They said even if we, even if we plan to destroy it, we couldn't destroy it as well as the NDP and the Liberals have done it over the last 15 years. That's staggering when investment dries up. But we told them Ontario's open for business and Thank you. The next question is the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The recent budget cut vital funding for municipalities and municipally cost shared programs. A plan increasing gas tax funding for municipal transit was cancelled costing more than 100 municipalities over $360 million per year in planned funding. Public health funding is being cut by $200 million per year. The Community Infrastructure Fund, which uh, funds projects in small, rural and northern municipalities, was retroactively cut by $100 million per year. Why is this Premier making life harder for families and businesses that count on these municipal programs? Questions to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. And through you to the Honourable Member, I'm, I'm surprised that uh, we haven't heard from him or his party when uh, we made a historic investment uh, in the last fiscal year. We provided 405 municipalities out of Ontario's 444 municipalities with over $200 million exactly. on a one-time basis to work on municipal modernization. You know, that was, a, that was a great announcement, one that has been celebrated across this province. 
You know, I, again, My Speaker, we, we work quite and closely with our this. municipal partners. We, chose not to. We, uh, we, we value the relationship that we, we have with them, and we're going to continue to sit down with them and talk about how we can assist and work with them. We, we, we know that there is a tremendous appetite out there for municipal officials to make their municipalities more effective and more efficient, and, and ensure that those critical services that they provide their constituents are done in the most efficient and effective way as possible. We value our relationship. We're going to continue to work with them. Speak. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, for almost half of Ontario's municipal governments, a 1% property tax increase raises only $50,000 per year. But the Premier has cancelled hundreds of millions of dollars of annual funding for municipally cost-shared programs, meaning either huge cuts or huge property tax increases. Yep. We are seeing cuts to flood protection, interlibrary loans and housing programs. The last Conservative government cancelled funding for municipal social housing and transit, and social housing and transit have been in a state of crisis ever since. Yeah. Why is the Premier repeating this shameful history with cuts to public health and other vital municipal programs? Again, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. To the Minister of Infrastructure. Hey. To the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Here we are, yet another day in question period, and the NDP continue to defend the uh, record of the former Liberal government. Well, I don't understand every day they are advocating on behalf of the former Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, uh, on March 12th, on behalf of Premier Ford and our government, I announced a $30 billion uh, uh, investment in infrastructure plan uh, for municipalities right across the province. That is a historic investment. And Mr. Speaker, uh, we're going to invest uh, $30 billion in roads and bridges, uh, transit right across the province, uh, green infrastructure like water and wastewater systems, uh, Mr. Speaker, as well as building uh, community centres, uh, recreation uh, and culture centres right across uh, this province. I would think that the NDP would support that type of investment uh, in their own communities right across this province. Thank you. The next question is the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. We know that when the people of Ontario elected our government, they did so wanting greater convenience and greater choice in their everyday lives. That's why our government promised during last year's election campaign to bring beer and wine into corner stores, big box stores, and even grocery stores. And when I went for my morning coffee at Clark's Variety, I heard from countless farmers, folks in rural Ontario who said, why can't we pick up a beer on our way home? Yesterday, a study from the Retail Council of Canada reaffirmed that our commitment will have a positive economic impact. In fact, it'll contribute over $3.5 billion to Ontario's economy. Speaker, could the minister share how details of bringing more convenience and more choice for Ontario's consumers will provide opportunities for job creators and consumers alike? Questions to the Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and to the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, for the question. By expanding choice and convenience for Ontario consumers, we're expanding opportunities for small businesses right across the province. Local store owners, brewers, consumers all stand to benefit from an expanded market. Yesterday, the Independent Retail Council of Canada said that if Ontario were to increase the number of retail stores selling alcohol, to meet just the national average, we would see 9,000 new jobs created in Ontario and $3.5 billion added to our GDP. Yeah. The, Retail Council, the Retail Council says, quote, greater choice for alcohol and increased convenience is both a strong win for Ontario consumers as well for Ontario's economy. Speaker, we agree Response. and look forward to filling yet another promise made to the people of Ontario. Oh, well said. Supplementary question. Thank you for that response, Minister. I know members' opposition aren't interested in those sorts of economic impacts to our province and those jobs, but it's encouraging to hear the words of yesterday from the Independent Nonpartisan Retail Council of Canada. It's abundantly clear that our government is open for business and open for jobs, and it's going to continue putting people first in everything we do, as evident by the Retail Council of Canada's comments. But we also must ensure that the chamber changes we inevitably introduce are socially responsible and that the health and safety of our communities are maintained. Minister, 
Can you tell the House how our approach to modernizing alcohol sales embraces this immense economic opportunity while also ensuring it's done in a responsible manner? Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for the question. Speaker, not only does Ontario stand to benefit from the job creation opportunities that exist, but expanded choice and convenience would directly benefit consumers. Our proposed changes would allow responsible adult consumers to make the choices that are best for them. At the same time, we want to ensure that any proposed improvements will uphold the safety and health of all of our citizens and all of our communities. We have appointed Ken Hughes as special advisor. His experience as chair of Alberta Health Services will inform our government's absolutely responsible approach. Speaker. We continue to engage with a wide variety of groups, Response. and we look forward to working them on the great opportunities that lie ahead. Sure. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Education. Just last night, we learned of yet another cut hitting Ontario's child care system. Buried within the government's 2019 child care allocations is a $50 million cut to child care operators through the retroactive elimination of fee stabilization funding. Now, Mr. Speaker, fee stabilization was put in place in order to ensure that as our frontline child care workers saw their wages rightly increase, operators would not be forced to either increase fees for parents or lay workers off. Simply put, Mr. Speaker, the funding helped keep kids in reliable care, kept parents from seeing a hike in their fees, and helped Ontario workers keep their jobs. Why is the minister taking this away? Question is to the Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to stand and speak in the House today, Speaker, to um, dispel yet another NDP myth that they're trying to perpetuate. The manner in which this party is trying to fearmonger is just staggering. And this is another example, because quite frankly, all I have to say is Bill 148, that fee stabilization was put in place to correct a mistake that the former Liberal government made, and you backed them up yet again. Do you know, decision after decision. Can I ask the minister to make her comments through the floor, or through, through the chair, rather, not across the floor? Again, the minister to conclude her response. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And you know, the decisions made, daycare across Ontario, absolutely unaffordable. unaffordable. The previous government raised Ontario's minimum wage by 20 per cent, and that was absolutely unmanageable for Ontario's child care sector. So what are we doing? We're fixing the mistake that the NDP backed up that the Liberal Party made. And the fact of the matter is we're investing $2 billion to get Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I don't know why this government is in such a rush to get it so very wrong. The abrupt end to this stabilization funding means that child care facilities are being hit with massive changes to their funding formulas with absolutely no warning from this government. Clearly, this government has no idea how this change will impact Ontario families because, once again, they haven't consulted with the key stakeholders before they pull the funding. To make matters worse, Mr. Speaker, 44 out of 47 child care delivery and oversight boards had their general allocation funding cut this year, leaving parents again to pick up the tab. Since forming government, the Conservatives have made child care less safe for children, more expensive for parents, and created absolute chaos for child care providers and educators. Sure. Why? <laughs> Minister. Speaker. The answer to why is very simple. We were elected as a government to fix the mess the Liberal government made over the last 15 years that this party propped up. Honestly, we're getting it right once and for all for Ontario daycare. We're investing over $2 billion. We're continuing with the wage enhancement grant. We're continuing with on home child care enhancement grant. And we're also continuing with the qualification upgrades for early childhood educators. Speaker, like never before, we're standing up and getting it right and standing with 
parents. We're going to be leaving, ultimately, more money in their pockets because over and above everything else we're doing, we've introduced care, a tax credit that ultimately, ultimately will see relief from the cost of child care because it's going to be a tax credit that will enable parents flexibility, accessibility and affordability when it comes to child care. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, through you to the Premier, yesterday the Large Urban Mayors Caucus raised concerns over the Ford government's downloading by stealth agenda. This plan will place significant financial pressure on municipalities that are already struggling to cope with the cuts to library services and public health. Under its downloading by stealth agenda, this government will require municipalities to cost share childcare funding at a rate of 80 to 20 from its previous 100 percent funding. Why is this government unilaterally shifting these costs when we, on, when we know we only have one taxpayer? Why is this government using childcare cost sharing to offload their responsibility? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member will please take her seat. The government side will come to order. Once again, I need to be able to hear the member who actually has the floor, has the right to place a question, is not breaking the rules by loud interjections. Start the clock. I apologize to the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Please conclude your question. Why is this government using childcare cost sharing to offload their responsibilities onto municipalities, leaving them out to dry? Questions to the Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I can't believe what I just heard. Yeah. There's, a, there's one taxpayer? Yeah. This is a government that dismantled this province for decades. This is a, this is a government that put our debt, the largest sub-sovereign debt in the world, to $347 billion. When I was in New York, they couldn't believe it. This is a government that put our, our children, our families, the workers in this province, in debt a deficit of $15 billion. We have to be fis fiscally responsible, Mr. Speaker. I just can't believe the government for 15 years of scandal, mismanagement of money from the taxpayers actually has the nerve to get up there and say there's one taxpayers. They've never seen a dollar that they don't love spending. It's about tax, 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 spend, spend, spend. Order. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again, back to the Premier. This morning, we learned that the Ford government is cutting $50 million in funding that was meant to support child care centres in increasing costs of labour. The removal of this funding will destabilize the system and force child care centres to either cut staff or to raise fees for parents. Stop the clock again. The member for Kitchener Conestoga is warned. The member for Carleton is warned. Six members have been warned. Start the clock. Again, I apologize to the member for Scarborough Guildwood. The centre in Peel that is already raising fees by $72 because of this devastating cuts. Families simply can't afford hundreds more dollars for childcare costs. Mr. Speaker, why is this Premier forcing increased fees on childcare centres at the same time downloading its responsibilities to municipalities? It's like you're giving with one hand and taking from the next, and it is wrong and it's hurting families and also destabilizing a system that they rely on. Premier to reply. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, they were taking from both hands. <laughs> By, uh, through you, Mr. Speaker. 
Through you, Mr. Speaker, the reason they're raising it $72 is because the previous government raised the minimum wage from 11 and change up to $14. I spoke to child care uh, folks, and they can't afford to hire people because of the minimum wage. What we're doing, we're putting a care tax credit. Yep. A care tax credit, which is a child care expense deduction, we're investing $2 billion. Yep. Families, families can receive up to $6,000 per child under the age of seven, Mr. Speaker. They're going to get a tax credit of $3,750 from seven up to 16 years of age, and anyone with a severe disability are going to get a tax credit of $8,250. We're helping 300,000 families out there. 300,000 families, they will have a choice where they get their child care. Stop the clock. The member for Orléans is warned. It's not helpful. We're trying to have decorum in this House for the remainder of question period. It's the Speaker's obligation to try to maintain that. I need your help. Start the clock. The next question is the member for Markham Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Transportation. Recently, the Premier and the Minister of Transportation unveiled a bold vision for transit right here in the GTHA. It is a $28.5 billion on transit vision to expand the province's subway network by 50%. Mr. Speaker, this is a historical announcement, and this is by far the most money ever invested to get shovel in the ground and get the new subway built. Our transit vision includes expanding the transit option for Scarborough residents who have been ignored for far too long. Moving forward with the desperately needed Ontario line, extending the TTC subway into the York region, Markham and Richmond Hill, and extending the Eclington West LRT. People have waited long enough Question. for integrated regional transit system. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Transportation update the legislature on the upload? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Mark, Markham uh, Thornhill. It's uh, a great opportunity to work with you, and he's been a strong advocate for our extension of our subways up north. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I was honoured to be invited to speak at this morning at the Toronto Board of Trade's uh, annual breakfast, and I really thank them for the invite. Uh, I announced that uh, tomorrow in this legislature I will be introducing the Getting Ontario Moving Act, and if passed, it will give us the legislative tools to upload ownership of future subway expansion projects so, to the province so that we can get them built and build them faster, Mr. Speaker. That is our government's plan to get people moving and get the economy going. Mr. Speaker, in the past, other governments have made promises to expand transit in the GTHA, but red tape and politics prevented that from happening. Time and again, people have been disappointed when nothing gets built. Mr. Speaker, during the campaign, Response. our party promised to upload responsibility for subway infrastructure to build subways faster, get Ontario's moving. And Mr. Speaker, we're just doing that, and I look forward to, to more answers in my supplemental. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for the transportation for the very informative and exciting update. Our government for the people is moving full stream. I had to call true to our commitment to get the people across Ontario moving. As the minister has stated, our subway transit vision will include the Ontario line, which will provide real relief line from congestion on line one. It will be twice as long and move twice as many people as the original relief line project. And we will get done at about the same cost. The Young North Subway Extension will connect the subway to one of the region's largest employment centers. We will build a long-weighted three-stop Scarborough subway extension, and we will add the Eclington Crosstown West extension through Etobicoke. Can the Minister of Transportation share more detail about the legislation question. being tabled tomorrow? Minister of Transportation. Again. Thanks again for that question, Mr. Speaker. Today, 
stated before, the province is in the best position to build transit. We will be able to prioritize transportation projects and make decisions based on what is best for the people of Ontario, not just Toronto. Mr. Speaker, we have a greater capacity to finance projects and move them along much, much quick, quicker. We have the resources and the decision-making abilities, and we can issue, issue ministerial zoning orders, and we can compel utilities to prioritize our projects. Mr. Speaker, we will utilize the city's previous planning at, that they have done, and we're going to use it to working with the city, with the federal government, in order to build and develop and, and create a truly regional transit system. We're going to be connecting neighbourhoods that have never been connected before, Mr. Speaker. We're going to be working towards fair integration. Mr. Speaker, this is great news for the province of Ontario as we work forward to implementing our $28.5 billion investment in transit in the City of Toronto. And Thank you. Next question, the member for Tomiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. This week, the Premier and the Finance Minister took their partisan news service on a trip to New York City. But media report that the Premier's office has refused to disclose the cost of the trip. Uh -oh. Will the Premier tell us how much the public will be paying for his trip to New York? It's a very simple question. Minister of Finance. Well, thank you very much for the question. I can tell you it was a great honour to uh, join the Premier in New York uh, this past week. It's interesting, uh, Speaker, that since we have uh, come out of the budget blackout period, we have raised $4.6 billion uh, from the markets, and, and half of that, Speaker, was in U.S. dollars. Uh, there is unbelievable confidence for the first time in the province of Ontario. They loved our open for business, open for jobs message. They love the fact that we've cut red tape, that we have a job creation investment fund, that we've cut the WSIB fees of $1.45 billion, that we scrapped the cap and trade, that we have put, that we have cut the hydro bills. We are open for business and open for jobs, and they spoke loud and clear with their checkbooks, Speaker. Supplementary question. Well, the Premier was gone. We've seen the government announce they don't have funds to maintain student breakfasts or teachers in the classroom or even flood management in Ontario to deal, scrambles to deal with record flooding. At the very least, the Premier of this province owes the people. At the very least, order. The people of this province deserve to know how much this trip cost. Obviously, the Premier's office does not have unbelievable confidence in its own numbers. It's a simple question, deserves a simple answer. The trip cost X. How much? Stop the clock. <laughs> the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South is warned. Restart the clock. Pre or, Minister of Finance to reply. Much. You know, we took a, a fabulous message to the investors and the business prospects in New York. They love the fact that we are transforming government. They love the fact that we are modernizing government. They love the fact that we are digitizing government. In fact, we told them the story about exactly how if they went to their DMV to get their license renewed, now in Ontario, you can now go online to renew your license. You can now go online to renew your vehicle registration. You can now go online. So we showed them what we mean by digitizing our government. We told them that we had a plan to save four cents on every dollar spent, and in fact, our plan to date has resulted in almost eight cents on every dollar spent in savings. And, Speaker, they were thrilled to hear that not only are we doing this without increasing taxes, we're returning $26 billion in relief Response. to Ontario's families. They found that the situation is better today than it was 10 months ago. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I begin, I just wanted to uh, welcome to the legislature the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs, and in particular, Fire Chief Pascal Meunier from Carleton Place, 
Fire Chief Ken Stevenson from Brooks Falls and District, and Fire Chief Brian Wilson from Clarence right. Rockland, who I look forward to meeting with later today. I also want to give a quick shout out to Fire Chief uh, Kemayat from Ottawa, who couldn't be here today. Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Solicitor General. Protecting citizens is at the core of our government's work for the people, and the enforcement of modern and robust fire safety rules protects the lives of citizens, as well as our hardworking firefighters. And Mr. Speaker, we know that fire regulations are a key part of ensuring the safety of our communities. These regulations aren't always on top of mind for everyday citizens, but they have a big impact on fire services' ability to do their job. Could the Solicitor Question. General please let us know how improving these regulations are making firefighters and citizens safer? <clears throat> Opposition, come to order. Solicitor General. Thank you, and thank you for the member from Carleton for uh, your important question, but also for serving on the caucus advisory uh, team for Solicitor General. You know, her advice is very valuable, so thank you. I would also like to uh, welcome and thank the fire chiefs for uh, joining us today at Queen's Park. It's an important uh, advocacy that you need to do to educate us as MPPs, so thank you. You know, your officers, the brave men and women on the front lines, keep our families safe. And as a government, we're committed to ensuring firefighters and regulations support firefighters across Ontario. Whether you live in Kenora or Cambridge, Ottawa or Oxford, I can assure you that the regulations that we put in place are going to be appropriate for the communities that you serve, and we will continue to do that. As you know, uh, there are some new regulations coming forward uh, in the early summer uh, that Response. will really make an impact for the services as well as the communities that we serve. I want to assure you that we will continue to make sure that those regulations are appropriate for the size and the service of the community that you serve. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you, I would like to thank the Solicitor General for her response. It's uh, truly an honour to serve on the Caucus Advisory Committee and to work with our first responders in all, of, all, all across the province. Um, Mr. Speaker, firefighters have always stood up for the safety of communities, and now that they have a government that respects and supports them as they carry out very difficult and very dangerous jobs each and every day, we ask these brave men and women to potentially put themselves in harm's way to keep our loved ones and our communities safe. And in return, we see it as only fair to support them in their important duties. And through you, Mr. Speaker, could the Solicitor General please tell us more about how our government is providing better support to firefighters across Ottawa and Ontario and improving fire safety? Thank you. Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. So, as you know, our government values the important work that firefighters do as they place themselves and in harm's way. And I want to, want to also uh, give a shout out to the volunteer firefighters because they also play a vital safety role in our small town communities. So it's, uh, it's frankly why we amended the Fire Protection and Prevention Act this past fall to ensure that full-time firefighters can volunteer their services if they choose in their home community. And I, I would be remiss not to highlight, Speaker, your work uh, for many years in opposition on this issue, and of course, my friend and colleague, the Minister of Labour, to uh, bring forward this amendment. It uh, makes a real difference in our smaller communities, so thank you. Uh, these amendments protect firefighters and municipalities from any pressure to dismiss professional firefighters from what is commonly referred to as double hatting. This will also ensure that professional firefighters cannot face association penalties for double hatting and to allow municipalities to include them in their service model. Our government is restoring respect Spons. for first responders and uh, including firefighters, and I want to thank them for their service. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Yesterday, Hamilton Wentworth District School Board announced that 99 teachers will be laid off. That's enough to staff two full high schools. I've heard from a math teacher who lives in Flamborough, Glanbrook, Whoa. who is on maternity leave and has received her notice stating she no longer has a job to return to. Why does the minister and the member from Flamborough, Glanbrook think it's okay to gut schools in Hamilton? Good question. Questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And quite frankly, we don't. What we're doing is restoring trust, 
transparency and accountability to provinces' finances, and we expect our education partners to work with us in that regard as well. You know, we, the GSN notifications just went out on Friday, and we're going to be working with school boards to make sure that the efficiencies that are found within their administration are not impacting our classrooms. We want to work and establish a precedent in terms of making sure that our dollars Ontario tax dollars are going into sustaining and building and growing a learning environment that is effective for both the student and the teacher because our number one priority is student achievement, and we can't lose sight of that. Response. And that's why we're working with our labour unions and working with our education partners and invited them to come forward through to May 31st with ideas, suggestions, offsets. Thank you. Supplementary question, the member Thank you, Speaker. The question is to the Minister of Education as well. Speaker, uh, in the Greater Sudbury Region, 51 high school teachers at the Rainbow District School Board received redundancy notices on Friday. Sure. While in past years there's a chance that these educators would be reassigned, this government's cuts to education make the threat of job losses very real. These teachers are not resigning, Speaker, and they're not retiring. They can be out of this job as a direct result of the Conservatives' cuts to the education system. What does the minister have to say to the hardworking educators in Sudbury, worried that they could lose their jobs? Good question. Good minister. Well, the first thing I have to say to all teachers in Ontario is please don't get caught up in the fear-mongering we're hearing from the members of the opposition day in and day out. We have a huge mess to fix in Ontario, and every sector has to do their part. But I can tell you, our number one priority is that classroom. It's the learning environment in the classroom that is absolutely focused on student achievement. We're standing with teachers. We're standing with students so that teachers, students, and ultimately parents have absolute confidence in what is going on and, and happening in our classroom in terms of addressing getting back to the basics, making sure that our students have the job skills and the life skills they need to ensure a job of today and for tomorrow as well. And when it Response. comes to making sure that we get things right, you know, I heard the, the member opposite say that teachers received notification of redundancies on Friday. That board only received their GSN on Friday. There's too much fear. Thank you. Thank you. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Barrie Innisfil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. I join my colleagues in the House today to solemnly mark and observe Yom Hashanah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. This day is about the tragic loss of more than six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust, and honors those who survived this unmarkable tragedy. Sadly, the th threat of hatred is not isolated in our history books. In fact, the Canadian Centre of Jewish Statistics cited an alarming sharp increase in hate crimes in 2017, with incidents targeting religion up to 80 per cent. Anti-Semitism was a factor in one in five incidents, and we saw an increase in 400 hate crimes reported to the police over the previous year. Could the Attorney General please tell this House how our government is standing up against hate? Thank you. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Barry Innisfil uh, for her important question on Ontario's 20th anniversary of Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance Day. This is a day we come together as Ontarians to make sure that we never forget and that we are vigilant against the rise of hate in our communities. We have zero tolerance for hate of any form here in Ontario. And it's why I'm working with my colleagues and my ministry to create a new working group of regional hate crime crown specialists. This new group will ensure a consistent approach is taken to combating hate crimes. This group will work to create closer relation relationships with police officers investigating these heinous crimes. It will also work closely with community partners to develop specialized training for our lawyers to ensure that they are sensitive to the unique elements of hate crimes and the deep impacts that they have in our communities. Supplementary question. Great answer. 
right answer. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Attorney General for letting us know about the important work that is underway to uproot the seeds of hate from our communities, where everyone deserves to live free of hate and of intimidation from violence. From this terrible period in our history has emerged a glimmer of light with remarkable stories of hate, uh, faith, hope, resilience, and determination. We know many survivors have immigrated to Canada and settled in Ontario, and we are fortunate to count them among our neighbours and our community leaders. Could the Attorney, Attorney General reflect on the importance of working with and honouring the stories of the victims of the Holocaust and our commitment to never forget? Response. Hey, General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We can never stand back and cede ground to the rise of hate. A part of the responsibility we share is to carry in our hearts the stories of heartbreak and terror that many of our neighbours and their families experienced in this dark chapter of history. I recently had the privilege to meet Max Eisen, a, report, a remarkable constituent in my riding of York Simcoe, who shared his story of survival in his book, By Chance Alone. In it, he wrote, and I quote, I found myself in the men's line with my father and my uncle. My grandfather, my grandmother, my mother, still holding baby Judith, my two younger siblings, and my aunt all marched away in the other group. Everything happened swiftly, and we had no time to think. I didn't have the opportunity to talk to my mother, nor did our eyes meet, and I wasn't able to say goodbye to her." End quote. The horrors that Max Eisen and so many others faced challenge us to keep fighting against the rise of hatred in Ontario. We can't let them down, and we won't. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Solicitor General. It's been nearly 10 months since 62 recommendations were made to prevent overdose deaths in Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center. The inquest was sparked after a wave of inmates overdosed in this correctional facility, a problem which has sadly continued since the recommendations were released. This week, an inmate overdosed less than 24 hours after families and friends had placed 15 crosses outside of the facility to represent the inmates who have died since 2012. The Solicitor General has until May to respond to these recommendations. What day this month can the people of Hamilton expect the Minister's response? Questions to the Solicitor General. Thank you. You know, the uh, member opposite raises, uh, frankly, a very tragic um, issue that is happening within our corrections institutions and, frankly, within our society. Uh, when people choose to uh, use and abuse drugs, uh, it has an impact. It has an impact on our streets. It has an impact in our, in our hospitals. It has an impact in our institutions. Order. What I am doing is, is not waiting for recommendations. I'm not waiting to react. We've already made some quantitative changes that are seeing improvements, but it takes time. As the member opposite knows full well, these are not issues that started 10 months ago. These are issues that have been ongoing. We have been giving our uh, corrections officers and staff additional tools, but we need help. We need help from uh, individuals to stop Response. bringing Ill illicit drugs into our jails. We, we need to make sure that everybody understands this is a societal problem, and we will work collectively with my uh, partners in the— Thank you. Supplementary. The member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to, also to the Solicitor General. There's a crisis in corrections under the Liberals, and now there's one under the Conservatives. In March, a constituent from my riding, Angela Case, sent the Solicitor General a letter. She told her about how her 20-year-old, 22-year-old son died of fentanyl overdose in the Niagara Detention Center. She explained that the detention center was built to house 125 inmates, but currently has 250. Angela explained where the government's protocols and regulations come up short in preventing the death of her son. But the Solicitor General 
didn't even have the courtesy to respond. Shame. When will the Solicitor General respond to Angela and tell her how the government has created a system where people overdose on fentanyl inside our jails? You know, I, I can't imagine, as a mother, hearing um, such a tragic uh, death happening in our institutions. But I also want the members to understand and appreciate that every time that we assess an individual who comes into our prisons, every time we take that 24 to 48 hours to make sure that people are not suffering from an overdose, it is a challenge. And it is a challenge that we are dealing with head on. Frankly, that is why last week we made an announcement of a new investment of a new jail in Thunder Bay. We understand that you can't have waiting lists in our corrections institutions. We have no choice. We must take the people who need to serve in our institutions. There is no waiting Response. list in an Ontario jail. We are working on it. These are issues that have, to have uh, festered, quite frankly, for many, many years, and we've already started to make investments take and changes and take Thank you. I'm going to advise the House again that the following members were warned this morning during question period. The member for Sault Ste. Marie, the member for King Vaughan, the member for Niagara West, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, the member for Kitchener-Conestoga, the member for Carleton, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, and the member for Orléans. I remind the members that those members that if, if they've been warned, the warning carries over into the afternoon sitting. And if you have been warned and the speaker has to call you to order again, you may be named and have to leave the chamber for the remainder of the day. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Acting Premier concerning the cost of the trip to New York City. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on the motion that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
would ask the members to please take their seats. On April the 11th, 2019, Mr. Fidelli moved, seconded by Mr. Ford, that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the court. Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker, Ms. Thompson, Mr. 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 Thompson, Mr.
Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barr. Mr. Barr. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough. Mr. Cho Scarborough. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller. Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller. Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Down. Mr. Down. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalandra. Mr. Kalandra. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. Parsa. Mr. Parsa. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Moran. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Mrs. Carhalio. Mrs. Carhalio. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cram. Mr. Cram. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Wise. Mr. Anon. Mr. Anon. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Quarth. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Quarth. Mr. Bow. Mr. Bow. Mr. Cazetta. Mr. Cazetta. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapas. Canapas. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Mr. Pan. Mr. Pan. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Madame Jelen. Madame Jelen. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Vanto. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Momacle. Mr. Momacle. Mr. Yar. Mr. Yar. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Linda. Ms. Linda. Ms. Stiles. Ms. Stiles. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh. Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Raykosovich. Mr. Raykosovich. Mr. Harder. Mr. Harder. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. The ayes are 68, the nays are 40. The ayes being 68, the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.